Hello, my friend. How are you? I hope you're having an excellent day. This is Heather. This is the Back to Me podcast. This is the awesome human edition where we are talking to some amazing, I call them celebrities because I always learn something. So that makes them a celebrity in my world. And today we're talking to Talia Pellegrini. And Talia, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. I, I, I'm i cold, if I'm being completely honest. <laughs> yes. In a pathetic British way. I'm a little <laughs> bit cold, but I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, we all have our ups and downs in weather, and <laughs> being cold and not cold. And I, my, my mother was born in, in Nottingham, so, you know, I have some of that pathetic coldness in me every now and then. <laughs> and you do um, coaching, but it's very specific, isn't it? Well, I'm a registered nutritional therapist, so I, I don't call myself a coach. That's okay. not quite what I do. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm I'm a nutritionist or a nutritional therapist. It's a sort of inter- interchangeable terms. Yeah. So my job is to be a health detective rather than just support people with their health goals. It's to really understand um, the root causes of their illness or their um, uh, health struggles and then to guide them um, with very specific protocols created for them back to wellness back to vibrancy ideally I love the term health detective that is fabulous uh, because it is I mean there is no one size fits all at all no. is there I mean I've found that so many people will jump onto it the latest trend of this is the latest superfood and this is the latest um diet protocol but they don't they don't work across the board no not at all do you find that a lot of people come to you with that kind of uh idea of like well why can't i just do fill in the blank i'm quite um forceful i think when it comes to um discouraging clients from googling Right. (laughs) Because what tends to happen is they will Google something, they'll come and say, well, I've just read that the thing I have to do is this. And invariably, it's not the case. And invariably, it's a celebrity has tried it. And their um, success may be motivated by something other than truth. Um, So (laughs) uh, I always say, well, you know, we're looking after you and your biochemistry, your physiology, your health is unique to you. So we need to work out what is going on with your health. And, you know, for me, that that health detective element means that in my initial consultation with a client, I go right back to birth. Um, And, you know, we're learning more and more now that actually your grandmother's health might be implicating could be implicating your health so generational trauma can inform our health two generations later which is absolutely fascinating but if you had um various events in your childhood they may dictate your your health now particularly with regards to autoimmunity it's fascinating so just because some celebrity is saying if you take this supplement you'll feel fantastic that's not it's not really going to the depth we need to get to to go to to really help someone Right. And something that I always am super curious about is what brought you into this profession? Well, um, I used to be a television presenter for the BBC for years. Um, And the reason I got to live that dream got to do this amazing job that meant I sounds super glamorous you know it was super glamorous <laughs> was that a nutritionist helped change my life so when I was about 17 18 I got glandular fever which I think you guys call mono um, oh, right. it's Epstein-Barr virus and I was very ill and I was ill for about seven or eight years in natural fact and I graduated from university and I was trying to hold down a job in London and I couldn't I was just perpetually ill Um, And in desperation, I wandered into a bookshop because my solace, my answers have always come from books. And I found a book that says, Beat Stress and Fatigue. I read it and at the back there was a list of nutritionists. And this was going back, we're talking the 90s. um, And nutritionists weren't really a thing back then. And there were about four of them. Um, One of them lived in North London, which is where I lived. And I went to see her and in three months she changed my life. Wow. Um, so I went off and had this dream career. I loved it. And then I reached this point where I thought, I'm having a lot of fun, but I feel the call to do something else, something more. And I never forgot that woman. And I never forgot the impact she had on my life. And I also never lost my interest in nutrition because of what she'd taught me. And I thought, oh, how amazing if I could do that for other people. So I retrained. I spent three and a half years retraining. 
and I qualified in 2009. Wow. And it is true that some an experience, um, like we mentioned trauma and childhood, and good or bad, an experience can so change the trajectory of, of your life and what you take from that and where what it grows into. Um, that's very cool. And how long did it take her to to for you to have that difference happen in your life when you started working with her? It was about three months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. About three to four months. Yeah, and after years, life. right? Yeah, exactly. Of GP saying, you know, you'll grow out of it. There's nothing we can do. You have this virus. We can't do anything. Um, yes. And it turned out we could. <laughs> and it turns out yes well and i mean i don't i don't i don't give doc gps a hard time because they only know as much as they know and they can't know everything but i wish they would um expand their why don't you go talk to yeah. conversations i think I'm, it's one of the things i'm passionate about i i really believe that if every doctor surgery had a nutritionist we would change the health dynamic of nations you know um i have clients who are doctors i've had three gps in, on my books this year who've said you know i can't heal myself i don't i can't i i have hormone imbalance like this is how i feel i've had you know stomach problems all my life i don't know what to do and they come to me and we we sort them out um and they often go off and say i need to, to find out more about nutrition because they'll say well i had six hours training in medical yeah. school maybe maybe two days um and you know i work with gps often as well to um, you know most healing can be multidisciplinary it's often takes more than one expert or practitioner to bring someone back together and that includes i work with perimenopausal women predominantly so hrt is very much a part of their um coping mechanism for this that yeah. transition so i do work with gps so but yeah it definitely there, there are some um more open-minded um doctors than others but i'm and sure that will change i'm sure it will start it'll continue to evolve like you said in yes. the 90s there was what four mm -hmm. listed and uh, and it's been growing ever since and as people start to realize the benefits of it and it is true i mean i like how you call it a coping mechanism <laughs> or <laughs> replacement it's like because in theory and i'm going to say in theory because i don't know what else to say it is a natural process but yes. we don't know how to manage it but I Speaking think, menopause, of course, but... Well, childbirth is a, a natural process, um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be entitled to pain relief if you wish to have it. Right. Um, and I think some women sail through menopause and others do not. Um, and there are many ways to support that transition. And obviously, from my perspective, I come at it from a holistic um, standpoint, predominantly, and I don't believe HRT is a magic bullet. So it works wonderfully for with some women, but generally it works wonderfully in alongside other strategies that look at stress management and how they're sleeping and how they're moving their body and how they breathe and all of those things, right. how they eat. Um, so yeah, it's just about um, saying, you know what? Yes, we could cope, but do we have to cope? Why don't we? open our arms to the idea of vibrancy and maybe that's okay too. And even just because I've had this conversation myself with my doctor, even if you use that route of HRT, um, there's a point where they will take you off of it because they feel that it's not safe past a certain length, at least here, uh, past a certain length of time. And then, and then you're left with the, now what do I do? <laughs> You know, yeah, sure. which is, again, you're kind of like left out in the wilderness with the what am I supposed to do? How can I feel? I I have a, I think of it as like, how can I feel like myself again? You Absolutely. know what I mean? I, I always say to, to my clients that I think this time in our lives is an incredible opportunity to reset, to rebalance to reevaluate um, and i think it's a really important time because i think if we don't it's harder to catch up as it were this is the time to invest in practices to look to your well-being to give yourself permission to do that that's huge for my clients 
um, and then really reap the benefits. And the truth is that when we feel energized and vibrant and happy and healthy, everyone we love benefits anyway. Um, and actually, if we just keep ignoring our well-being, it can wait, it can wait, it can wait. Um, I think it's if we wait until our 50s, well into our 50s, then that just makes it harder. Um, yeah, everything is harder the longer mm -hmm. you wait in in all aspects. And we were talking um, at the end, of course, it's going across the bottom of the screen. It's a, it's a form of self-neglect if you actually don't take care of yourself. And uh, I used an example one day where, you know, you people take better care of their cars than their bodies, but you can trade your car in. <laughs> You can't yes, train exactly. your body in. Yeah, exactly. We, we just get the one. <laughs> yes. They haven't figured that one out yet. Not I'm yet. sure someone's working on it. Yeah, I'm sure. So when, so I, because I know that you do, do you do one-on-one -on -one as well as group programs? So I do. And actually my group program, um, the heart of all of my work is one-to-one. -one. So I do run a group program, but um, each person on that group program also has one-to-one -one sessions with me because to make that transformation or change in someone's health, you have to do one-to-one -one work. I have to get to know them. I have to understand their specific health history and their challenges. And it's so there's so much work that goes into transforming someone's health. Health, there's so much complexity to it that it, there's no, like you said earlier, there's no cookie cutter um, approach. It's I can't I, it's, if I could just print out, you know, a cheat sheet and hand it out to women and say this is the solution to all your problems. Um, that would be great. It doesn't work that way. And some women come to me with really complex health problems. Um, and that takes some unpicking and exploring. And I love that element of my job, but it's very, very bespoke. So we always have to do one-to-one. -one. And it can't, like the, um, the, the experience of the life journey compounds, you know, adds on the things that you're carrying with you. And I guess mm -hmm. that is like, trying to unpick all those knots would be, yeah, that would be very difficult in a just group program, like fill out yes. this questionnaire and do this. Exactly. And, and, yeah. and um, I work predominantly with, with mums. So I'm known as the knackered mums nutritionist. I don't think that's a word you particularly use. Um, I watch a lot of, uh, I watch a lot of Brit box. So. Okay. <laughs> so knackered basically means super tired. Um, and of course, the reason I work with women for a period usually of six months minimum is because we have to be realistic about the fact that their health journey isn't in a vacuum. It, it exists alongside, particularly given the age we are, it exists alongside aging parents, raising children, you know, working hard, all of these things that take our time understandably and our passion, our energy. So we have, sometimes it is a pause and then start, pause and start, or two steps back, three steps forward, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but I always say that small changes consistently made are powerful. So as long as we are making progress, um, no matter how small it can feel sometimes when there's so much else going on around us, that's, that's valuable, that's important. And we do, and I know sometimes people do feel like I can't possibly because and that whole list of things you said, I can't because yes. kids and jobs and family and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when the tendency is to be the, I'll figure it out later. I think it sounds, I don't want this to sound um, harsh, but when we say I don't have time for myself, what we're saying is I'm not willing to make time for myself. And I say that knowing fully how hard some women work and how their day looks but if you don't make time for your health, your illness will make you make time. So I work with women who say I have zero time and we find ways. It's not about creating more time. It's about looking at the time we have and thinking about how we can shift it so that you allow yourself to prioritize your well-being. That's not you instead of the people you love. It's alongside the people you love. Um, and, you know, a lot of people don't do that and have never done that. But the impact is ill health, it's low energy, it's tiredness from the moment they wake up, it's health niggles like headaches or bloating or constipation or any number of seemingly insignificant things that actually have an effect on how you feel each and every single day of your life. Um, and I don't think that's okay. No, I and I mean, that's part of why I 
have this podcast is because I don't think it's okay because I, I know that there's various aspects to your health and if one of them isn't like especially physical health if you're mm-hmm. not taking your care of your physical health it overflows into the rest of the things that you are important to you mm-hmm. and we forget that if we feel good sometimes we f- we forget that if we feel good the rest of things go better <laughs> so yes. it's like yes it's like a ripple effect yeah and i see that with my clients all the time and i honestly think when they start working with me they want to believe that they can feel completely different and they don't really believe it until Mm -hmm. we get them there and then the energy isn't just because they're eating better the energy is because they feel different and that means their confidence has changed their vibrancy is better so there's a positive ripple they have more confidence to change their job to to have more time with their partner to parent in a way that feels happier for them because perhaps their kids weren't getting the best of them and, but it starts with us. It has to start with us saying, I deserve to feel better. I do enough um, and I deserve to feel better than I do. Um, you know, there can be uh, the number of, of women who come to me with crippling period pain mm. where they are doubled over every month. And I have not worked with a woman yet whose period pain I have completely eliminated in three to six cycles. And yet they would have suffered like that probably for 20 years, 30 years, if their period started when they were, you know, 11, 12 years old. And I'm staggered by that. It really breaks my heart that they were told that's normal to take some painkillers. And I've Um, known people who were prescribed painkillers for that. Yes. And I was myself. Right. I was myself before I trained. And then, you know, I was in clinic, training clinic. So I had to rack up about 250 hours in training clinic. And it would be myself and another student and a qualified nutritionist in the room taking notes. And I was being the the client for another student. And I was saying that I was having this this pain. I was almost, I was close to vomiting with it. And um, I had been prescribed medication just that week. And the nutritionist in the room, the qualified nutritionist said, do you have any healthy fat in your diet? And I thought about it and I thought, you know, not really. And she said, right, I want you to go away and I want you to eat eggs and hummus and oily fish three times a week and nuts and seeds. And I want you to see how you feel. Within three months, the pain had gone. Wow. It's never come back. And simply you weren't having enough. I had no healthy fats in my diet. It was a simple dietary intervention. Um, I didn't even take any supplements. There are some supplements that can be really, really helpful as well. I didn't even take, I literally just did that. Um, We don't, we don't tell our teenagers that we don't, you know. We say fat is bad. (laughs) You know, it's like an across the board. Oh, I can't eat the fat. Fat makes you fat. Like that's still, that's still in the psychology. I know, and that's and so I, I preach about the importance of healthy fats a lot <laughs> right. wherever I can. You know, essential uh, fatty acids are so cool because our body can't make them, so they have to come from our diet. And if we don't have them, it has a, an implica- it impacts our hormonal health, our mental health, our nervous system, um, our skin, our cardiovascular health. They're, they're essential for a reason. So, you know, uh, there's been a whole generation, probably two generations of women, particularly in the UK, where low fat reigned supreme in the 80s. You know, everything was low fat. Um, and it's done a terrible disservice to a great many women, millions of women, because they are fat phobic. They will look at an avocado and back away because right. they see it as calories. They, all they see is the calories and the fat. Um, so, yeah, we need to, fat needs to be rebranded. Yes, we could come up with a new name for it, (laughs) but (laughs) that's the problem, isn't it? It's like we have to make it sound good. I know. And I want to go back a little bit because you said something that I found fascinating. So your grandmother's health effects can, what is, what is that that they're discovering? It's to do with um, our nervous systems and it's to do with what um, genetically gets passed down Um, and we understand more and more about two areas than we did before. We understand more about the central nervous system and how powerful an impact that can have across generations. 
and also um, our cellular health. You know, if we go right down to our cells, go, go down to our mitochondria, which are these little powerhouses in each cell. And we used to think that they were just there to produce ATP. They were there to produce energy. And now we realize that they're, they are much more important. They're much more nuanced in terms of our resilience, our emotional and physical resilience. So we're just begin we're still learning so much but we know, for example, if a woman is very stressed in her pregnancy, that can affect the central nervous system, mm. her fetus, and we can see there, therefore more health problems in, in children, unfortunately, in terms of behavioral problems or learning um, challenges. So the idea, I think we're really understanding the first, the, we'll talk, talk about the th first thousand days. So we talk about a woman's pregnancy and that first three, four months after um, a baby is born and how key they are for for well-being so obviously we support women to eat really well as well as they can in their pregnancy and even if you're first trimester you all you want is you know cookies and and white bread that's fine that we just have to get through the first trimester really everyone <laughs> but then we need to be thinking about are we getting our fish oils if we eat if we're willing to take them are we getting our folate are we getting enough antioxidants are we moving our body are you know are we managing our stress what is clear is stress management is so significant right for any age every age and i think for example i have a, a almost 13 year old and raising him and seeing the challenges he has to cope with in the world which are so different to the world I grew up in. You know, they are so anxious and stressed, these kids, and they've just lived through a pandemic and the world is a pretty scary place. So it, stress management applies, tools to manage stress apply from childhood, um, not just in perimenopause, not just in our 40s or 30s. Um, and that's a big part of my work is supporting women's lifestyle choices to manage their stress. And it is true. I mean, not even before the pandemic, even before all of this strange world happened. I mean, I don't remember any previous times when I was hearing about children having to be on anti-anxiety medication. Yeah. And even though childhood is uncertain and unpredictable, um, I don't feel like when I was growing up, there was anybody really, except for maybe a very few exceptions of children having to be medicated. And mm -hmm. they're so, and I mean, it's more than just the, I think it's more than just society. I mean, it is, I think, nutrition and uh, lifestyle going on. And it's, I guess it's like finding ways to support that in the best yes. way we can, no matter how old you are, because yeah. it is true. You know, children are stressed, moms are stressed. Yeah, and we model for our kids. So sometimes when I'm talking to a woman and I'm trying to motivate her to give herself this time to look after herself or to resolve her health issues, she will still be carrying that sense of guilt around spending time or money on herself, investing in herself. And often what persuades them, not from my persuasion, but what they allow themselves to think about is what they're modeling for their children. What are their children learning? And for some women, it's their teenage daughters and they know that they have a really, the mothers have a really poor relationship with food, a really disordered approach to eating, which they've probably had all their lives, probably learned from their mothers. Um, and they don't want their daughters to, to, be, to be the same way around food. So that can be very motivating. Or just knowing that you are so exhausted your kids aren't getting the best of you because you're stressed and so you're snapping and you're shouting and you're not present when you're there and those things can be what shifts a mum into saying okay i'm gonna do this but it can be a really big deal for her to do that some women are like yeah i'm just i'm done i can't face this anymore i had a a lady who's been in my community for probably 18 months and she came and did one of my free challenges where i spend a week doing short workshops and I chatted to her and she said, I don't have time. I feel dreadful all the time, but I don't have time for me. I said, okay, wow. no problem. It was lovely to meet you. And she stayed in my community and she called me literally, she didn't realize it was so, literally a year to the day later. And she said, you told me nothing changes if nothing changes. It's a year later and I feel exactly the same. I can't bear the idea of feeling like this in another year. So we started working together. 
so we started working together in September and she's feeling better already <clears throat> so it's that sometimes it's it's that shock and realization of oh wow I felt like this a year ago right. and actually before that some women will say I've been exhausted since my children were born and their children are secondary school right um so they're sort of 12 13 um it doesn't it doesn't get better just because they're not babies anymore and when they're sleep deprived. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's a whole rack of other reasons why you're going to be tired. Yes. <laughs> Sadly. So I'm curious also, um, so for, for perimenopause, because I know you work quite a bit with perimenopausal women, um, and there's a whole slew of things that happens to you. Mm -hmm. I remember going through it, and I said to one of my friends at one point, why didn't anybody tell me? that this was going to happen because you know you you know the usual things they people talk mm -hmm. about the hot flashes but there's so much more that's happening and mm -hmm. it's if you have no one to ask i mean your doctor when i went to my doctor they just said oh yeah that's normal and you know carry on but there's been no there's no support so i love the fact that that's kind of like part of what your program is do you find there's mm -hmm. a commonality of what happens with people or we know there are 34 recognized symptoms of perimenopause. I couldn't even 34. come up with that. <laughs> so most women think of menopause as happening around the age of 50. They think of hot flushes or hot, we call them flushes. You call them flushes, um, you know, night sweats. And that's what women really think of when they think of menopause. For so many women, that tends to be late perimenopause. So if your listeners aren't clear, perimenopause is kind of the journey to menopause. Menopause means you've had 12 consecutive months without a period. And at that point, you're postmenopausal. You've reached menopause, you're postmenopausal. Perimenopause is the journey that gets you to that point. And for some women, it's three, four years. Some women, it's 10, 11 years. So you mm. can be in your late 30s and be perimenopausal. Wow. And the symptoms might be period changes they might be your libido is changing they might be skin changes i hear skin changes a lot your eczema suddenly come back after years you've got psoriasis one of the big ones for, for that i hear is palpitations and anxiety and it scares the living daylights out of women and brain changes so cognition women that say i can't i was looking at a, a spoon the other day and i couldn't remember what it was called and that can be really dis 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 what's what i'm looking for uh, disconcerting maybe disconcerting yes it's, it's, I'm perimenopausal um, <laughs> it can be really disconcerting because if you are you know you're working in a senior position that can really affect your confidence but it can just be frightening because you think is this dementia is this what is happening to my body I was always so shocked for me I couldn't spell like I used to oh, wow. so I've, I was always a sort of a you know an ace speller I could spell anything and I sort of two three years ago I'm 48 uh, next year I noticed that I couldn't spell simple words anymore I thought well, what, what's going on and for me that's one of the cognition cognition um, challenges I've had so those I would say are the main ones so women will go to their doctors with heart palpitations and their doctors will prescribe beta blockers or antidepressants and actually they probably need some HRT it's hormonal fluctuations that are causing those things um and if you don't know that, so I really love it when women come into my program at around 39, 40, 41, because they can be so empowered going forward with all the information that I give them. If a woman comes to me, she's my age, 47, 48, it's incredibly helpful, really useful. Um, it really arms her with lots of information. But to make those changes before before or just at the start of that transition means she's going to make changes that make a real difference. Right. Um, and that's what I see a lot. Um, you know, anxiety is, is something we can make a big difference to. And that can be dietary and it can be nutritional deficiencies and it could be stress management. Um, and it's probably not. The answer probably isn't on a prescription pad. Um, but, you know, we, we work with with all options and all possibilities. Well, and I mean, we said it at the very beginning, everybody is different. Mm. And um, how some people I know. Um, when I've been on medications in the past, there's been the, we'll see how you tolerate it. So they can't even predict how you're going to react to something. And, you know, it's like, I know medications that were invented for one thing, but they said, oh, look, like Viagra, you know, it wasn't actually invented for what it's become so popular for. So 
they're never really sure. I feel like they're never really sure what's going to happen when they give you a medication, but it's being open to all possibilities. I mean, I, nutrition is, I can remember sitting with my naturopath at one point and he drew me the chemical cascade of hormones and where they're produced and why you end up having anxiety when you're in that perimenopausal phase because stress and different body parts are supposed to be doing different things. And it was fascinating. I can't remember any of it right now, but it, but it was fascinating. <laughs> it's progesterone. It's the, what your two key players are estrogen and progesterone. And through perimenopause, your estrogen is pretty steady until quite late in the transition. But your progesterone is doing this. And I always describe estrogen and progesterone as best buddies, but they're complete polar opposites. So estrogen is the party girl and progesterone is the chill out girl who likes to stay in and just keep it quiet. So she... Progesterone is it sort of keeps estrogen under control a little bit. So when your progesterone drops, estrogen not only is your progesterone dropped, not only have you lost the calming influence of your progesterone, you've also lost that calming effect on your estrogen. You've lost that the you know there's a duality where they kind of even each other out. So for most women in a, a normal menstrual cycle, that will be really noticeable maybe in their um, the second half of their cycle where they start getting. PMSE or ragey um, because of those fluctuations but in right. perimenopause those fluctuations can be more unpredictable and more dramatic so that's why we can feel more anxious and that's why we can get um, more dominant symptoms of estrogen which might be heavy periods which might be sore breasts which might be more pain which might be rage you know women will say to me I have rage and they don't they're not talking about PMS they all use that word rage i have rage and it scares me and it's estrogen unfettered unaccompanied by by the calming influence of progesterone and that's what they're experiencing it is crazy because i have had it and i'm a very calm cool collected person and the day that it happened <laughs> and of all things my lovely husband had done my laundry and brought it upstairs and i kicked the laundry bag across the room he is brilliant, though, because he just looked at me and said, going to bed. <laughs> that, that was it. Didn't engage. Didn't engage. Away. By the way, if there's any men listening, just step away because we can't control it. The next morning I said to him, I'm sorry, there was a crazy person inside of me and I didn't know what to do. So thank you for yeah. going to bed because I couldn't control her. I just recognized that she was insane and I had no control over what she was doing. And these are all things that are so helpful to know because otherwise you think you are losing your mind or you're having a heart attack or you're having a panic attack and you don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And being supported by nutrition, knowing, like being able to say, well, if I can do these things for myself, then that does feel very empowering. Like you're not in that out of control place and at the whim of whatever's going on. Do you find that you get a lot of that, like, superwoman feel? <laughs> Your clients come back saying, I'm a superwoman again. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, within the six-month uh, program, we talk, as a nutritional therapist, it's my job to guide lifestyle as well as nutrition. And what I do in my six-month program is I bring in experts who help to add to a woman's toolkit so i'll have someone who'll come in and do some emotional freedom techniques so tapping oh, right. someone who comes and, and talks about journaling empowerment coaches personal trainers um i've got a clinical psychologist doing this round and she comes and talks about people pleasing and the damage we do to ourselves when we strive for perfectionism as women so all of these things just add to our toolkit so that when we feel stressed overwhelmed we have explored ways to to calm ourselves down or to make ourselves happy or to release the anger release the frustration the resentment whatever it is um and, and I've learned so much from these experts as well. So my toolkit is, is, looks very different to how it did, you know, three or four years ago. Well, we always, we're always adding, right? We're just always adding the, you, there's always something else to learn and to add in and to be able to, to expand your ability to help others, which 
which I love, which is, I always say the podcast is partly for me because I get 34 things. I had no idea there was 34 <laughs> things. <laughs> so um, just before we head off, I, it's going to be in the show notes, but it's what's their best way for them to contact you, your website or? There are lots of ways. Mm. Um, I have a website, uh, which is thaliapellegrini.com. Um, I'm on Instagram, Thalia Pellegrini underscore nutrition. And on my website and on um, Instagram, you can access my free masterclass, which is the three secrets to happy hormones. Um, and that's just a really enlightening um, exploration of why we feel this way and what's driving it and what we can do to, to shift how we're feeling. Um, and there's information there about my six month group program, which is called the Energized Mum Method. Um, I don't just work with mums. I do seem to attract knackered mums, hence the, the name. Um, and I work with women one-to-one. -one. So you can find me on my website, on social media, or just get in touch with me. You can email me. I'm sure you'll share the email address. So anyone Absolutely. who wants to reach out, I offer a free call, a free Zoom call to anyone, wherever they are in the world, just to see if we're a good fit. Chemistry matters so much when it comes to your health. You have to trust someone and connect with someone. And um, so I offer that free call just to, to see if we click and to see if I think I can transform your health. And if I think I can't, I will I will say so. And if I think I can, I will say so. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, all that information is in the show notes 100%. So we'll make sure everybody can get into contact with you. And then before, because I want to honor everyone's time before we exit, though, um, do you have any final words of wisdom? I read a quote a couple of years ago that I can't attribute to anyone. It was anonymous, but I always use it. And it's the quote is, she made a promise to herself to hold her own well-being sacred. And I think that's very powerful. So I invite anyone listening to think about that and think about whether they hold their own well-being sacred. And in, perhaps if they want to explore ways that they might do that, what might that look like for them? That's outstanding. That's perfect. Thank you so much for that, Talia. Pleasure. Thank you for taking some time and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And my friends in podcast land, get in contact because when you feel better, you know the rest of the world will unfold much better. Click, comment, subscribe, all those good things. And we'll see you again next time.